everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, not so sunny Birmingham. Um, we're here to talk to you today about um, Whaley Bridge uh, and a, an extremely busy week for us in the um, beginning of August. Um, I'm Donna Jordan. I'm Strategic Head of Comms and Engagement for Derbyshire Constabulary. Um, I've been in policing for just short of 16 years. Um, crisis comms is part of what we do. Um, but obviously this was something that was an unprecedented incident for us, something that we've not dealt with to the levels that we have had to in Derbyshire. And um, it was a significant crisis that fortunately resulted in nobody actually dying. <coughs> yep, and um, I'm Julie Odoms. I'm Assistant Director of Communications and Customers at Derbyshire County Council. And it was <coughs> very, very much a, a team effort between ourselves um, the police and other agencies to make what became actually a focus of international news for a period of a week, something that went pretty well on the whole, yeah. I think. Um, so, yeah, so what we're going to do is talk you through it and talk you through kind of how it unfolded over the week-long period that we were dealing with um, so you've got a sense of that story of what we were doing. So... As I said, this is the, the story of, of crisis communications, really. So just a, a bit of an explanation of where Whaley Bridge is. And you rem might remember this happened back in August. Um, so you can see in the picture there, that is the town of Whaley Bridge, which is in the northwest of Derbyshire. Um, so actually quite close to Manchester. A lot of people who live there commute in and out of Manchester. Um, there's about 7,000 people who live there. But there's a really, really good community spirit it there um, and a very tight-knit community you can see in the top left of the picture there the kind of dark sort of blob that is Toddbrook West Reservoir and the dam is the kind of grey and beige wall in front of it so as you can see it sits right over the top of the town it's owned by the Canals and Rivers Trust it's been there since 1840 um, so this is quite an old piece of infrastructure but has never had any issues um, and it's, it's the place where people go and walk their dogs around from the town. They go up there and have picnics. You know, it's never... It's a site of special scientific interest. Nobody has ever been worried about it at all. There's been no reason to be. Um, and the reservoir itself flows into a canal, flows into the River Goit, which flows down through the town. Um, and, yeah, everyone's been, for more than 100 years, entirely relaxed about the whole thing. Yeah, so for Julie and I, it was very interesting because we had both started our jobs on the 1st of July 2019. So we'd been four weeks in when this incident actually broke. We'd also both started jobs where we'd worked in different counties. So we were coming into Derbyshire, finding our feet, getting to know our teams and actually trying to understand how the organisations work. So this was very much a case of having to hit the ground running. Yeah. So it starts on Wednesday afternoon. Um, mid-afternoon and um, I get my head of comms who sits kind of next to me just went oh Julie just to be aware we've just picked up this video on our social media um, doesn't normally look like this so something for you to just be aware of there so I'm going to try and play you a bit of the video <coughs> okay so this is the, the dam that you could see, normally no water comes over this at all. It is completely dry, and it is really not dry on that day. And there's people stood kind of taking this bit of video at the side. You can see the speed of the water and the weight of the water that's coming over. don't know how well you can see it. Right at the bottom there, that's a children's playground at the bottom of the dam, which is a fabulous place to put a children's playground. And that's already <laughs> flooding at this point. Um, you can see kind of in the corner there, just the speed and the level of the water. And loads of people stood around <laughs> taking videos, you know, not at all worried about it. Um, so, yeah, so this get, gets flagged to me with a bit of a... Might want to keep an eye on this one. Might be a bit of an issue here. I, it has been raining for days at this point and raining heavily. So I'll pause that. So from a policing perspective, the team were made aware of localised flooding. Obviously, we could see some of these issues that were happening and we were sort of monitoring social media to actually know that there was an increase in significant water. Discussions at that point were from a local level around what are we going to need to do, just around sandbagging, linking in from an emergency planning perspective, linking in with the council and the local parish, parish council with regards to what that actually looked like. 
So we're getting ready at this point on the Wednesday. But, you know, everyone's pretty chilled. Probably all going to be fine. Don't worry too much about it. So from a policing perspective, at um, 10... Was it 10:40 a.m. in the morning? We got a call from somebody into the control room who basically said, "I'm at the bowling club and the reservoir is collapsing, and I've been watching it for five minutes. A huge concrete slab, about 15 to 20 feet long, has fallen off, and another piece is coming away as we speak. There's a lot of houses in direct line of it, so if it goes, it's so dangerous. The concrete holding the water is completely disintegrating." Obviously, that's where not panic sets in, but it's a, a case, yeah. a case really of, right, this is where we actually need to start pressing the buttons around emergency planning and actually local resilience forums and actually that emergency response. So police um, resources went on site from about 10 past 11 began, and we began posting on social media at that point where we established the hashtag Whaley Bridge. Obviously, we wanted to make sure that we were involved in that conversation and that's what people could search for. A big thing for us as well at that point was ensuring that we were in warning people to stay away from the area. Um, about two o'clock in the afternoon of that day, that was when we started asking people to actually leave the area. So alongside this, we're kind of kicking in. So the Local Resilience Forum, which leads on these issues in Derbyshire, is led by the police, but is housed within the county council and a lot of the staff are in the council. So we've started to kick in our emergency planning procedures at this point. The police are the lead agency because this is already clearly going to be a major incident. So the police are the lead agency, so we're reposting everything they're posting. We set up a rest centre. The moment we feel this is going to get evacuated and people are going to have to move out, we set up a rest centre at the nearest school um, and staff that, and we start closing off the area, so closing the roads around it, basically isolating the town so people can't get back into it. Interestingly, at around 11.30 in the morning, the Canals and Rivers Trust are still quite confident it's fine. This is before the police, you know, the, but they're saying, we don't need to evacuate. Yep, the dam's not looking great, but we think we can hold it. We think it's okay. Still raining at this point. Um, and actually, it becomes pretty apparent to everybody pretty quickly that that's not going to be the case. We are all getting lots of information in still. So Donna's team's getting huge numbers of calls, social media posts. We're getting people sending in social media. In, this, in that initial phase, there's a lot of information flying around and it's very difficult to tell what's correct and what isn't. And from a comms point of view, we've obviously got to be incredibly careful that what we're putting out is the right and accurate information. So it's quite challenging at that point because you're trying to react very quickly, but you've got to make sure that you're right in what you're posting. Um, and yeah, we, we were getting lots of, and in a couple of slides time, we were getting lots of not only people asking questions, but people asking for su offering support as well, which is lovely, but another thing that you have to manage in this kind of situation. So we'll just give you a, a, a real sort of quick clip. This is the, the dam, and obviously you can see the concrete um, back there. Uh, obviously, as more and more water was coming through, there was a real concern that the silt and such like there was just going to sort of suddenly go and the whole dam would give way. We were really, really fortunate that Derbyshire have invested in drone capacity. So the drone was really, really important for us around giving us an insight into what was actually happening on the ground. It also offered a real opportunity around crime prevention to reassure the, the communities once evacuation had happened, but also to actually give us a picture as to what was actually happening at the time. So that's, we're not going to play the whole thing, but this video here... Um, <coughs> prior to sort of the engineers coming and actually looking at the dam um, we had a number of police officers who were on the dam uh, on the bridge sandbagging and you can't quite see at this point there's a I don't know whether you can see there's a police officer just here who's on a, um, a pulley rope um, at that point there the structural engineer says the dam's going to breach the dam's going to breach get off he's tied on can't do much about it carries on sandbagging. So that's the sort of heroes that we think in terms of, of Whaley Bridge. Yeah. There we go. So this is, and you probably can't see these very clearly, but I mentioned we're getting lots of inquiries in and we're getting lots of offers of support in. So the one on the left um, is, it's a, a local Sikh charity actually. They're UK wide, but they've got a, a Manchester and Derbyshire branch of. And they're, 
contacting in going to do you require any items or assistance for family um, that have been evacuated we have teams ready and we're ready to help where needed we're trying to, we're getting loads of this in lots and lots of people saying what can we do how can we help and we're trying to get back to them saying this is what you can do this is what you can help but obviously there's a bit of delay in that you know I've got all 12 of my comms team is working on this at the time all of Donna's team is working on it at the time and even so we can't manage everything that's coming in and what happens is other people start jumping in and giving information so the second tweet down is from Whaley Bridge School um, and they say apparently if you ring 101 they'll put you through in terms of dealing with the evacuation thanks for your kind offer of help um, and that, you know they get a reply and then they go on at the bottom to say you know well, we forward it on to the response teams thanks again the dam is holding so far now they're trying to be helpful you know and they're trying to get they're trying to go back to people who are offering help and to be fair they have referred it through to us they've referred it to the right people but there was loads of this going on and we are at this point really having to establish us as the trusted sources of information you come to the police you come to the county council we know what's going on and there's a lot of that to manage so we're constantly alongside the information we're putting out putting out the come to us come to the police that those are your trusted sources but it's really challenging in this situation yeah within um derbyshire constabulary we had one person at the time who was actually doing the monitoring of social media comments and replying to people uh, and the tweet on the right uh, the mess direct message on the right hand side is around um am i able to get home in whaley bridge on jodrell road currently at work in chinley need to get my cat um we replied you won't be able to get into the evacuated area at all and they've said is the evacuated area anywhere spe uh, specified anywhere? So we've referred them to um, what is the rest centre. It's Chapel High School, Long Lane, Chapel on the Frith. Sorry, I meant where exactly has been evacuated, which area? There's nowhere explaining where it needs to be evacuated. And at that point, that's where we've sort of started putting in the road closures and the, and the map as to where it is. So there is, that information is there, but understandably, people, because you're there talking, are asking you their direct personal questions. And, you know, the moment you get the, I need to get my cat tweet, you know, there is the kind of, but actually this is really important to people and it's what they're worried about. So we're doing our very best to get back to all of this stuff, but there is hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of them. So lunchtime on Thursday, the 1st of August, um, it becomes BBC News' top story. Um, again, police officers are putting sandbags down at the dam, and obviously the structural engineer has told everybody to leave the dam as it is likely to breach. At quarter past two, police decide to evacuate and issue a media statement to encourage a 1,000 people to leave their homes. So there's obviously the logistics <coughs> there of actually trying to get people actually out of the area, ensuring that people can get in and out, but obviously not allowing anybody additional actually into the area. Um, we're constantly doing social media activity at that point. We are leading as a force in terms of that information. Derbyshire County Council are reposting that information, as are a number of other agencies. And they also issue extra information about the rest centre and road closures. Um, we are doing whatever we can around the website, on Facebook and Twitter, and that's being promoted as the primary trusted source. Um, by mid-afternoon, there was an emergency phone line set up by Derbyshire County Council, which we were able to include in our messaging. And it was really important for us to ensure that we started that battle rhythm of regular <coughs> social and media uh, website postings. Um, and it was really, really important for us that we were that one true voice. And I think whilst the digital is absolutely our primary way of getting information out here, that kind of, it, you still need some of that backup, more traditional stuff. So I manage our call centre as well. <coughs> so we had to, and the technicalities of setting up a specific number getting the staff there who are answering the calls briefed because it's no good if they don't know what to say and they're not giving any useful information making sure they've got what they need drafting in extra staff to answer the calls getting people there overnight because we don't run a 24-hour call center apart from social care emergencies normally um, and as well at the rest center we need those people to have information because there's people going in on the ground going when will i be able to get home can i get my dog out so the digital stuff's the primary bit but you can't forget the other stuff in the background as well so yeah by thursday afternoon uh, mid-afternoon on thursday this is international news because the new the media were getting the feel we were going to evacuate so by quarter past two they know this is going to happen and we are deluged and i mean deluged obviously with rain, but also with media inquiries at this point. So, you know, you've got CNN top left covering it, bottom left, Mail Online, 
daily record not being at all emotive there with crying residents and crumbling dam, you know. Um, and bottom right is Newsnight. So, you know, they're all going. This is phone calls into the, into the press offices all the time. Media starting to turn up on site um, as well. You know, into the police, into us. Loads and loads of it. Saudi Gazette on the left-hand side um, are covering it as well. In the Already at this point, you've got specialist people. Um, this is a, a civil engineering piece, a paper here, a specialist journal, talking about kind of the, the technicalities behind it. They've got inquiries. They want to speak to civil engineers. We're a bit busy trying to hold the dam up, you know. Um, and Sky News have got people crying all over the, the, the TV as well, you know, and understandably because it's a scary situation for people. Um, so, yeah, the, the media challenge is significant at this point. Um, and, yeah, so by the evening, um, we're still... So we know that by the evening the rain's still coming, that dam is looking properly dodgy, um, and we end up evacuating people further downstream, out, away from Whaley Bridge as well. And, they, again, as Donna said, that's a huge logistical operation to get those people out. We've got people who have evacuated. Most of them have found relatives to stay with, but not all. Um, so the County Council has... We have to find hotels in safe areas... Fortunately, um, University um, of Derby has got a Buxton campus, which is about half an hour's drive away from Whaley Bridge. So we put people up in student rooms. It's August, they're not there, so we get, we, we get them into there. But this, it, we're having to do this incredibly quickly. People with little kids, you know, sort of older, vulnerable people. We've got, Whaley Bridge is quite a, a nice area. There's quite a lot of older people there. With So we've got quite a lot of social care needs in this situation as well for people. So we're having to make sure those people are looked after and the constant media inquiries as I said now I have to say and I think we both felt this yeah. on the whole the media were really really good and really they were you know we were both dealing with them directly I was on the ground on Friday at the rest centre they were respectful they were polite they were helpful they totally got how difficult this was for us and they were grateful for the information that we were giving them they were really good on the whole the media were actually really good and I, I was quite surprised by that and I was quite relieved by that as well um, and both teams are on social throughout the night we're still answering media inquiries at one o'clock in the morning on Friday um, we had a second the dam is going to go because it didn't go when they when they yeah. first called it at one o'clock in the morning it really did nearly go. It was genuinely this close. We still had, although we'd evacuated, there were people who'd refused to go. Not many, but there were some. There is no doubt at all that if that dam had gone, they would have died. It, you know, and all of that would have been washed away. And it, you know, in this situation, lots of people go, "Oh, you know, you're being overcautious. You don't need to evacuate." It was genuinely this close, and we thought it was going to go. I think the other thing with that is the fact that had it gone, it would have obliterated. Um, people's homes, yeah. the, the amount of water, there's something like 550, um, I can't remember what the figures were, but it was um, it's, it's millions of tonnes of water. 300 million yeah. gallons of water or something that would yeah. have gone through that village. And obviously for us as well, um, there was, had to have, we were having to have a link with Greater Manchester because Stockport would have been flooded. Yeah. So again, it, it's a wider piece than just in Derbyshire. <coughs> Okay, um, so Friday the 2nd of August in the early morning, um, the military um, became involved. So we had army who were called down and they were started sandbagging. They were trying to sandbag the river to stop the inlets coming into the reservoir. But also the RAF sent in their Chinook, um, which was extremely helpful. Um, it was uh, working overnight <laughs> yeah. and through the day and in total um, actually put down 530 tonnes of aggregate which was actually into the, into the dam to actually shore it up. Um, it was a pin, pinpoint precision uh, operation that basically the bags were dropped where a laser was pointed. It was amazing to see. Um, you had to stand a bit further away so you didn't get sort of wet because of the, the um, draft from the uh, rotors. But it was absolutely amazing in terms of what they were doing. So this was a case about filling it up and then basically it was concreted in um, to try and ensure that it was being secured. In addition to that, we had um, a construction company who had to basically build a road, allow the pumps to go in, then dig up the road because it was, there was a real issue around heavy plant and obviously really, really sodden ground 
and these pumps getting stuck in the area. So Kia Construction were absolutely fantastic to allow the fire service in particular to get those pumps in to actually be starting to get some of that water out of the actual um, reservoir. In addition to that, we were obviously doing media management on the ground, um, national and international media throughout the day. We were having to try to organise vantage points for the media so they could see the dam, but obviously to also ensure that they were safe if anything did actually happen. Uh, and dealing with that in itself, where the, the, sometimes the journalists were just abandoning vehicles wherever they wanted to, um, was interesting in itself. Um, but again, social media for us was a real prime um, thing around informing, warning and informing people. So uh, again, the Chinook, um, for local residents, it became a real symbol of hope. Um, because they could see the fact that activity was happening, they'd hear it coming over in the morning, they knew things were happening. And, um, and interestingly, at the end of uh, the operation, we had a number of people who actually did paintings and things of the Chinook, yeah. um, gifted artwork to yeah. the force and, and other agencies <laughs> as a thank you. But it became that real, um, it was the image of Whaley Bridge was the Chinook with the bags over the dam. Um, Again, like I say, the laser was used and it was a really, really important factor of that. Um, again, we were using social media monitoring to help shape our response in the things that we were actually putting out to the public. So we timestamped our appeals, so we used images that had got the timestamps on and we were able to actually put that out so people would know when they were going to be getting a regular update. We included road closure maps on there. And we had things like people complaining about the fact that they couldn't get to their pets or they were concerned about their pets, which when I sat in the strategic coordination group, I was able to get that information from my team and feed that back directly into the gold commander who could then make decisions as to what operational activity was going to happen. <coughs> um, we used imagery quite a lot. So again, the drone was on the ground. Officers were sending images back into us, so we were able to use that. We had a press officer on the ground taking photos, again, to use on our channels. And imagery for us was a really important part, both in terms of reassurance of the fact of what we were doing, but also giving that update. Um, we held a press conference, and we Facebook Lived that press conference. So, again, there were a number of residents that weren't necessarily able to get there. Um, and we also had a number of public meetings where the decision was made at that point to allow people 15 minutes back into their properties for the collection of pets and any emergency medication. Okay, so whilst this is going on, oops, didn't mean to do that, sorry. Oh, Stuart, I've broken it. <laughs> no, I have broken it. <laughs> um, sorry, bear with me. We're up to there, aren't we? Okay, so slide. there we go. Okay, so throughout this, obviously, we're still um, acting. So our council leader, um, we're doing kind of videos and blogs of him throughout this period, and he's obviously very keen to be getting that message out as well. So he does a, a little bit. I'll just play you a little bit of, of what we put out. You'll be aware of the serious ongoing situation at Whaley Bridge with regards to the safety of the dam. And if you're one of the residents who have been evacuated, I'm sure you'll be feeling very anxious about your situation, your home or your business, and what happens next. First. Okay, so. I've clearly completely broken the technology. Um, so he's doing updates and we're facilitating those. Um, we've got, I'm on the ground managing the media. I've never done a Polish TV interview before, but there's a first time for everything. Um, so doing that. Also, at the same time, government starts calling COBRA meetings um, and they want information out of both of us. So, and Donna's kind of the key point for that information. But I get the, they want to know how many calls we've had to the call centre, what questions being asked how we're responding they want quite a lot of detail and this is the background stuff that's happening whilst we're trying to do all the frontline stuff for people as well so it's it's kind of worth being aware that there's all these background demands happening at the same time that you need to facilitate um, as Don said, you know, residents meeting and press conference on that Friday. And we're still doing the constant social posting, constant engagement. And then, and I've spoiled it by going on to the next slide, um, this happens. 
<laughs> Was helpful. Yeah. <laughs> So on the Saturday we continued with the same sort of pattern that we'd had for the last two days. Um, we'd widely promoted the helpline but it was getting low numbers and that was mainly because people were actually getting their information that they needed online. We had a further ministerial visit, we had the yeah. environment agents, uh, the environmental minister who yeah. came, we had Jeremy Corbyn decided to yeah, yeah. pop up. Yeah. Um, so we had an, a number of visits at that time. Um, the Environment Agency remodelled what the plan looked like and decided to evacuate another 55 homes. So we were obviously having to put out the information with regards to that as well. And we kept having to move these high volume pumps um, because obviously as the water was being drained down, it was very, very difficult for them to actually get the pumps access to the water. So they were having to be pulled further and further in. Um, so. I think there were 16 large volume pumps at that point that were actually draining water down as quickly as possible. So obviously the quicker we could actually drain down the water, the quicker people could get back to their homes. Okay, so, uh, yeah, you go, Donna. Yeah. So because we had found that there were a number of people who had, decided, had the 15 minutes to go back to their homes, but a few had decided that they were going to stay, um, a decision was made to rescind the fact that people were going to be allowed back in. Um, so that evening we held a residence meeting um, where the Deputy Chief Constable, who was the Gold Commander, who'd been up since four in the morning uh, and was the person making all those big decisions, um, basically chaired the residence meeting where she told people that they were no longer going to be allowed back in. Um, the big focus for that was around, obviously, every time somebody was in their homes, emergency responders, police were going to go and having to go and knock on people's doors and make sure that they were OK. So obviously was therefore also putting them in at risk. Um, so that was the line that we, would, we took at that point in terms of ensuring that, um, you know, it was sort of encouraging people to actually leave. Um, because again, there was still a real risk of the fact that the dam could break, uh, could breach yeah. at that point. Because again, the weather wasn't particularly kind to us during that, during that yeah. weekend. Um, so we had that further public meeting. Um, as a result of that, we also then got another low, um, sort of low ball got thrown in where um, the Deputy Chief Constable, who's five foot tall, he's got big spiky hair, blonde, bleach blonde fr at the front of her hair, did an interview and then got a lot of trolling on um, social media, um, both about her sexuality, about her poor appearance. Um, she did an absolutely brilliant job. She did. Uh, and... Obviously, policing is, is increasingly more and more wanting to be representative of the communities. Um, but again, that in needed us to actually include some resource actually dealing with those issues yeah. around the trolling on social media. We found a lot of that trolling was coming from ex-police officers, unfortunately, yeah. retired police officers. Um, but again, it got picked up by the national media. They were wanting comments. We had to get the support of our chief constable, who was away, um, we ended up having to get statements in from the Police and Crime Commissioner. So for us, that added an additional dimension <coughs> to the crisis that we were dealing with already. And again, from, from Rachel's perspective, um, for, you know, from her, she took it really, really personally and sort of trying to deal with that with her when she's on Twitter herself, she's, you know, and it, it was really, really hard. Um, so uh, we supported her through that um, and... You know, she's. I think at some point she will actually do something um, publicly around the, the impact that that actually had on her. Uh, but that was another dimension to the crisis that we were dealing with. Yeah. Yeah. So Donna's managing all that, and you know, we're my leaders putting out you know messages of support yeah. for the fantastic job that Rachel's doing. Whilst you know all of this kind of really nasty stuff actually is aimed at her. Um, in the background, I've got. 62 councillors, all of whom desperately want to know what's going on, kind of <coughs> several thousand staff who need to know what's going on as well. Um, so my comms team is doing not only kind of that frontline comms, but is keeping all the councillors informed on a kind of twice-a-day basis of what we're doing. Um, 
It was the comms team that were updating the senior staff within the organisation. So we don't have a chief exec, but we have four exec directors. We're the ones passing the information up to them because emergency planning are just trying to deal with it. So we're keeping them informed as well. And it's, a, it's another example of that stuff that you need to do in the background because if you don't do it, you'll be getting the questions in saying, what's happening? I need to know. So it's making that time for who are your stakeholders actually here um, that you need to keep informed as well so we're kind of keeping all that running at the same time so yeah so Monday to Wednesday we're still going god we're tired at this point you know and you do you start to you just get really tired don't you yeah. and you lose a bit of your humanity you know people are still suffering people are still evacuated from their homes and you know we're getting stroppy about bloody hell you know we've had this message and things because you're tired and because you're stressed and that it's really important to bear in mind that impact on yourselves and your comms teams and how you manage that. And it's, you know, it, and we both did the kind of standing people up and standing people down bit, but none of our teams are massive. And if it goes on for a week, that's quite a heavy impact. So it's, it's a mind too as well, how you look after your own staff. <laughs> so, it's sometimes a case of having to force people to go home yeah. because everybody wants to be in the eye of the storm, really. Yeah, so. they do. Um, so yeah, so we're following the same pattern. We on the Monday set up a microsite with extra information in it and that really quickly becomes a trusted source for the community of information. It also prepares us for when people are able to go back home and the recovery information. So we get that in place on the Monday. Um, we set, so um, our leader has the idea to set up a relief fund where people can apply for money um, to support them if they've been evacuated or they've had business costs. So we additionally, we need Need to promote that and talk about that he's obviously very keen for that to be out there and my call center has to be ready to manage all the calls that come in to apply for those funds and there were quite a lot um so, we're so that's an extra bit that we're managing as well on top of the situation third ministerial visit on either monday or tuesday i can't even remember now when they came but this is you know that's constant as well cobra still meeting at this yes. point aren't they yes. so we're still updating cobra as well um further residence meetings, business meetings, you know, that are happening as well. Um, and as I said, we start to get ready. It starts to feel late Tuesday, like people might be able to go home soon. Um, Wednesday morning, it's definitely feeling like people might be able to go home soon. So we start getting the content ready for the microsite of the when you're home, what you need, your house has been flooded, this is who to contact and all of that. And leaflets to give people when they go home now that is old school isn't it running them off a photocopier and that kind of thing but it was partly to make sure we'd given people information it was also a requirement from cobra wasn't it that if we were going to let people go home we had to give them information to tell them what to do if we had to evacuate them again mm -hmm. and what the warning siren would be and we weren't we, they wouldn't let us let people go home unless they were given that information so to make sure that it was there um, and, and again people physically on the ground to put it through letterboxes give it to people as they go home so we're getting all of that ready kind of tuesday wednesday morning <coughs> yeah we'll play that one so this was mid-afternoon on the wednesday we oh, had a, a, a meeting in, a lunchtime meeting where confirmation was that the water was low enough to allow people to go back um, there were concern, uh, we'd mitigated the fact that um, in terms of the concerns, because what we didn't want to do was tell people to go back, then something happened, and then just have to re-evacuate them. So um, we had to make absolutely sure that once they were allowed to go back, that it was safe. Um, so we pulled together a video with police and fire, which uh, was about the return home, and this was promoted across social media and ensuring that we could get the word out very quickly. meeting at lunchtime today, I'm pleased to confirm that the, that the Environment Agency have given me reassurance that there is sufficient mitigation and measures in place to, to protect the people of Worley Bridge and the surrounding communities should there be a sudden and rapid increase in rain which would raise the levels of water within the reservoir. There are sufficient pumping arrangements there to get that water out quick enough. And indeed, in case of the worst case scenario, there are arrangements in place to help warn and inform local people and evacuate. But with the modelling that's taken place, they're happy that the arrangements in place are safe. And I'm pleased to say you can all return to your homes. I would like to thank you all once again for your absolute patience and your huge support that you've given to us. We are extremely grateful and it's made the world of difference to everybody working on this. I'm really sorry for the inconvenience caused. 
And I know when some of you go home, there will be some difficulties. So just to remind you, there will be a multi-agency hub available within Whaley Bridge, and there will be members of all the local resilience forum there, so local partners, and there will be an increased police presence there now for the forthcoming days, just to reassure you and to help you with any issues. Okay, thank you again to the community. We would also like to say that there will be further information via Derbyshire Alerts and on the police websites for those residents returning to Whaley Bridge and the surrounding areas. We are extremely grateful uh, and thankful uh, to the community for the support we've, we've been given to help us resolve this in in incident and bring uh, a safe conclusion together. Um, what I would say is the Fire Rescue Service has now got another operation and that is to decommission the pump and appliances and, and some of the equipment that we've got in the site and I'd ask residents to bear with us whilst we get that equipment away and back to the several fire and rescue services around the country who we have borrowed it from. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we created an information hub that was set up for local people at a primary school for the next few days so obviously people could actually go and have um, any, any inquiries that they'd got and work continued across all of our <coughs> social channels in the following days to reassure residents due to the expectation of further rain. So from digital media perspective, from a Derbyshire Police uh, perspective, we had 758,586 engagements on Facebook during that time, uh, 155.8 thousand engagements of which, and 273.8 thousand um, impressions on Twitter. We had a reach of over 4 million on both platforms. Um, so again, it was evident that our messages were getting out there. We responded to over 16,000 comments on social media of which 10,000 in were in the first couple of days of the news breaking. Um, we had additional sign-ups to Derbyshire Alert, which is a subscription um, material that we sort of use. So it's an email or text-based um, platform. <laughs> um, we had a number of people from Whaley Bridge who were saying that they didn't have internet access, so we were actually able to actually text them directly to their phones. Um, we had 32 Facebook posts, uh, which were a mixture of video, including the drone, um, text-based uh, text uh, messages and photos and the <coughs> website we created a, a bespoke area on our force website to divert people to the latest information which had 98,130 unique page views okay so and we're obviously kind of doing all the digital commitment as we've talked about I should say actually alongside what we were doing there in the website and the social media we were using our uh, email platform so we used the Granicus um, email system um, and we were posting out to our tens of thousands of followers on there as well information um, I mean our, our engagements on Facebook and Twitter are nothing like those of the police but they're a lot for us um, and quite a substantial increase for us and a lot of visits to that website with long dwell times on there and the communities really were using those ports of call as information to share with each other as well so I think that trusted source is really important and I, from our point of view Nobody, certainly I didn't hear anything, I don't think you did either, nobody complained that they didn't know anything, nobody said we're not getting information, because I never wanted comms to become the story, and our, and, and our failure to become the story, and you see that quite often, don't you? Um, and I was really pleased, I think that was the greatest measure of us doing our job well, that the story didn't become, people don't know anything, there's no information out there. So... And this, ah, <laughs> I'm going to do it. I'm going to show you this video. I am determined to do so because it's the end of the story. Oh, 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 oh. There we go. Yeah, there it is. It's me being cack handed with the buttons. There we go. So this is the end, end of the story. <laughs> Waiting at the Goyton and Whaley Bridge are having a much needed drink tonight. Back together, sharing stories. After a week, they'll never forget. It's been a lot of waiting, it's been a lot of watching, and my parents have been on the red class, and they've been able to see what's been going on, and we've been able to keep an eye on things. Every night you hear the pumps, you hear the chinooks first thing in the morning, um, but we're really lucky that nothing's happened. So much has happened in the last week. It's really brought everyone together, and... Um, has actually saved our town because, uh, no mistake, this town could have gone. Wednesday night's not normally this busy here, but the landlady says she just pleased she's got to come to come Shocking pie pouring, that is. Isn't it? <laughs> 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 like milk, yeah. <laughs> I find out where everybody's been and what, you know, where they were 
sheltering and who they were with. So yeah, it's been amazing to catch up with everybody. The emergency was declared officially over at lunchtime. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> no time getting back into their homes. Ruth was one of the first to return to Whaley Bridge. Um, I was packed in this refreshing trusser. <laughs> um, yeah, just been waiting for the update. So I thought we'd be about one o'clock, so yeah, I've been sat waiting for a while to hopefully get back in. So yeah, really relieved. Ruth's house sits below this reservoir that last week was overflowing and at risk of breaching. It's now almost empty. The local bike shop flooded this time last week. The owner, Fred, says it's a relief to be able to finally get back in to sort out the repairs. We were about uh, two foot down here, so water's dispensed itself. We didn't get quite a lot of uh, the water out. Should be uh, a couple of days to get everything sorted. Now the water level here is officially safe, the fire service is scaling back its operations at the reservoir site. We're now in the recovery phase, which means investigation work into what went wrong here can begin. The classes are half full tonight here. The people of this town know they've narrowly avoided a huge disaster. Stacey Foster, News at 10, Whaley Bridge. There we go. Thank you very much. Thank I you. appreciate we've run over a little bit there, but thank you. <laughs>